In he leapt like a frenzied god, his heart racing with slaughter, only his sword in hand, swirling in circles, slashing, hideous groans breaking, fighters stabbed by the blade, water flushed with blood. In his violent rage, Achilles touches the divine, waist deep in a river of Trojan blood, his heart merciless, his bronze armor blazing like fire, he stands like a god. This is what Nietzsche meant when he said that all higher beings are also immoral. Life is a fire which consumes itself, a serpent eating its own tail. In his own destruction, Achilles finds immortality. Conservatism is going nowhere, and progressivism is rapidly leading humanity in a direction which we do not wish to follow. The domestication, denaturing, and castration of man, the reduction of our species to its lowest states and lowest types. Conservatism opposes this totalitarian future, but only superficially. The modern political spectrum and its right-left dichotomy is an illusion. Its politics are petty and superficial. The true conflict at the heart of all political dispute concerns the nature of the world and man, and is revealed in the conflict between the pagan and monotheistic worldviews. Nietzsche sought to revive the pagan spirit, to go beyond the political and beyond the moral, by allying oneself with the impulse in life which reaches towards the heights. In his ideas of the will to power, the eternal recurrence, and the spirit of gravity, Nietzsche hits upon three fundamental metaphysical principles of pre-Platonic Hellenic paganism. As Heraclitus writes, all is flux. This is the fundamental pagan metaphysic and the basis of Nietzsche's will to power. The world is, most fundamentally, contending energies vying for power. The world is an endless cycle of creation and destruction, the lion eating the lamb, one planet consuming another. This means that all things, including time, are cyclical. Just as the world was born out of the subjugation of the primordial forces of chaos, these forces will one day return to destroy the world. Skull will consume the sun, but after Ragnarok, the world will be reborn again. Everything, including the soul or life force of a person, returns eternally. This conception of the universe completely refutes progressivism because there can be no progress in a cyclical world. The world tends towards chaos, disease, disorder. There is a powerful force in the world, call it entropy or the spirit of gravity, which aims to pull all things down, to level everything. But there is also a force in nature, something within life, which aims at the opposite, which aims at the heights, at the creation of something powerful, strong, and beautiful. This impulse is the will to power, and it finds its highest expression in the Greek gods and heroes. The fundamental metaphysic of the pagan universe is struggle, or in other words, war, but not the industrial wars of the 20th century, heroic war, powerful warrior kings contending with each other to be the best. Such war is an allegory for the divine drama of life in which nature's highest types are sacrificed. The Iliad, which could be considered to be the Bible of the Greeks, is such an allegory. In the tragic worldview, man is bound by fate, human nature, and the divine order of the world. Those who violate the natural order of the world, like Oedipus, bring about their own destruction. After the death of his friend, Achilles, nourished by nectar and ambrosia, which is the food of the gods, enters into a divine, berserker rage. He slaughters the Trojans and is about to sack Troy single-handedly against the will of the gods and fate when Apollo intervenes. He taunts Achilles, saying, Why are you chasing me? Why waste your speed? Son of Peleus, you are mortal and I am a deathless god. 
Achilles ascends to near godhood and almost defies the will of fate, but ultimately he succumbs to his mortality. Even godlike Achilles is insignificant when faced with the divine powers of the universe. However, this is not a nihilistic outlook. Within the constraints of fate, human nature, and the natural order of the world, something can be achieved. But this something is not a fundamental transformation of the world and human nature. It is the creation of higher types of men, higher states of being, and higher ways of life. Like Prometheus, with great sacrifice and great suffering, man can touch the divine. Monotheism's conflicts with the pagan worldview, such as linear time, and its views on human nature stem from the fact that monotheism finds its god outside of nature. This, however, allows us to see that the true conflict is not between monotheism and paganism, but between the natural perspective which all of humanity seems to have harbored until relatively recently, and an anti-natural perspective. Many sects of monotheism find their god in nature, upholding the natural order. This is especially the case in sects of Christianity, in which the pagan influence is strong. However, the common Judeo-Christian perspective is that God is beyond nature and created the world as perfect and just, without death, sickness, or evil. The world has become corrupted through man's sin. The world is fallen. This is the philosophical basis of all progressivism, that matter and human nature are corrupt, and that we must strive for the end of all strife and inequality in creation, that we must strive for the paradise at the end of linear history, in which the lion will lay down with the lamb. From this perspective, the natural order of the world is corrupt, not sacred and we must work to progress towards the kingdom of heaven, whose advent brings a total destruction and even inversion of the natural order and of human nature. We can see that the beliefs of modern leftists arise out of this anti-natural perspective, which although secularized, preserves the same fundamental presuppositions. Nietzsche sought to revive the pagan worldview, but he also retains the Judeo-Christian idea of a goal in history, or beyond history. He thus creates a progressive, or goal-oriented, pagan philosophy. In Christianity, Nietzsche saw a great regression and degeneration of mankind, and therefore finds his idea of progress in a reversal of Christian values, or a rediscovery of classical pagan values. Yet, Nietzsche says that Christianity was useful in disciplining the European spirit, but how exactly? It disciplined us to aim for a goal, which for the Christians was Christ, and for Nietzsche is the Ubermensch. Nietzsche wrote, Nature uses illusion to obtain her objectives. The true goal is concealed by a deluding image. We stretch our hands out towards this image, and nature reaches its goal through our deception. In Nietzsche's Ubermensch is the deluding image which we must chase to achieve nature's objectives. The true goal, a creature of beauty, power, and supreme health, a superman like blazing Achilles. To those who are still undomesticated and unbroken, those who still hear the whispers of nature, the Superman comes like a dream just beyond memory, a fleeting thought, a glimpse of something magnificent, a feeling of power. To recall this memory and reignite the flame of this ancient dream, one need only look to what the ancients believed. The Spartan would have laughed at the idea that the domestication and denaturing of man is progress. They believed in the divinity of nature and of the body, the divinity of struggle and competition. In their blood and in their souls, these men wanted to be powerful. 
beautiful, careless, and strong. They desired to be like the gods. And I am convinced that when this dream beyond memory is reignited, it will break the totalitarian grip of the life haters. Like a wildfire tearing through a dead wood, the spirit of Achilles will erupt again into modernity. Thank you.